But somebody came in my office this morning and looked over my shoulder at my computer screen, and I, I had the message up there, and they remarked, oh, another Christmas message. And I said, yes. And you may be thinking the same thing, Christmas was last week. Why another Christmas message? Well, we're having a Christmas message uh, because next week we're going to talk about planning and planning for our coming year. But in order to plan appropriately, in order to formulate a plan that is going to be pleasing to God and is going to be beneficial to us in the coming year, we need to have an ingredient that sometimes folks lack. And that ingredient is wisdom. Because if we're going to fashion a plan, we want it to be fashioned with wisdom, don't we? Uh, you know, of all the gifts given in Scripture, there are various ones, uh, but uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 3, uh, what gift is asked for and given? Anybody know off the top of your head? A guy by the name of Solomon, God asked him, what would you like and what did he ask for? Wisdom. Wisdom. Yes. The most valuable thing any of us can have, obviously other than our salvation, is wisdom. And that is, wisdom is the ability to apply what we know in an appropriate way that will be beneficial for ourselves and those around us. So this morning we're going to look at the three wise men and see what we can learn about wisdom by looking at their lives. Now, I believe this is a factual story, but I also believe it is a metaphor for all time about how wise men respond to God's call on their lives. And we, can, we, we use the term men generically here, men and women. How we respond to God's call on our lives. So next week we're going to talk about planning. This week we're going to talk about wisdom. Because fools also plan, don't they? Uh, but uh, sometimes their plans are not very helpful. So we're going to revisit the wise men. Uh, Mike gave us the big picture there, the context, as he read the story. And see uh, just exactly what we can learn about being wise. First thing we see about wise men or wise women, wise people, wise Christians, is they are watchful. They're watchful. Uh, in Jeremiah, God says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I firmly believe the reason a lot of Christians uh, never really get off the ground with their Christianity, never enjoy the abundant life that Jesus promised us, is because they're half-hearted about it. And they don't really put their all into it, and therefore they don't get very much out of it. The wise men, as we will see, were watchful, they were anticipating something was going to happen, and therefore, when it did, they recognized it. Now, they were astronomers, we know that historically, and uh, they were watching the skies, and they were watching every night uh, and trying to determine just what the stars were doing and where they were going, and all of a sudden, here comes an anomaly. A star that they had never seen before. Now, if they had been sitting on the sofa watching whatever they're watching, Desperate Housewives or whatever it is, would they have seen the star? No. If they would have been in their workshop with a can of beer and uh, a, a saw or a soldering iron or whatever it is they were doing, would they have seen the star? No. But because they were anticipating something, they were watching. And I think we would all see God do a lot more things in our lives if we were eagerly watching and anticipating. Because I think a lot of times God does things and we never see them because we aren't looking at them. How many of you have had the experience, and I know the answer to this, every one of you, of somebody asking you about something that you've seen every day for years maybe and you can't tell them what color it is or exactly where it is so you walk by this thing every day. Okay. And we've looked at this thing, whatever it is, a hundred times and yet we've never really seen it. So there's more to being watchful than merely looking. You have to look with anticipation. You have to be expecting God to do something. 
So these wise men, they were alert. So when God put the star in the sky, they saw it. Many Christians never see God working around them because they are not looking for him. We become so focused on other things that we miss the things of God, the things he wants to do in our lives. Now, sometimes we say, well, we're focused on other things, those must be bad things. No, not necessarily. For most of us, most of you, because you're all fine folks, our focus is diverted to onto good things, isn't it? Sure it is. Now, we, we wouldn't focus on bad things. We focus on good things. But if we become so focused on those good things, we may miss what God is doing. So we want to make sure we're focused on Him. Well, what, what kind of things might we focus on other than God? We could focus on our careers. Now, that's a good thing. Now, we want to be... Uh, good employees, we want to be successful individuals, but we don't want to focus on our careers at the expense of Christ, you see. We can be so focused on our families that we miss God. We can be uh, so focused on our recreational things that we miss God. And all those are good things. They just need to be kept in their proper place. We can be focused on other people. Now, in a negative sense, we might be focused on someone and we're jealous of them because of what they have. And we, we begin to become consumed with that. You've seen that happen to people. We can become focused on someone uh, because we resent them and we refuse to forgive them for something. And you've seen people do that too. And maybe you've done it for uh, periods of times in your lives where that thing begins to consume you and you'll miss what God is doing. The wise men were not looking at other people. They were not looking at themselves. They were looking at the sky anticipating God to reveal himself. And that's how I suggest we should be doing. Now we look in his word. We look in to his people. And God is revealing himself to us through them. Many times in the New Testament, Jesus warns us to be watchful. To be paying attention. In uh, Matthew chapter 24, with a portion known as the Olivet Discourse, he tells the, tells the disciples to be paying attention because they know not when he's going to show up. So be watchful. Always be watchful. Uh, chapter 25, the whole first part of the chapter is devoted to the story of the, of the ten virgins, you know, and five of them were wise and they were prepared and they were, they were watching and they were sharp and five of them were not. We want to be prepared. We want to be sharp. Are you expecting God to do something in your life? That's the question. Are you expecting Him to do something in your life this coming year? I hope so. Are you actively seeking Him? I hope so. You know, in, in 2 Chronicles, it's, he says that the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. So God may be calling you to do something that is way bigger than you. We talked about that here a week or so ago. That you may not have the facilities to do. You may not have the strength to do. You may not have the resources to do. But guess what? If you throw your whole heart into it, God says he'll strengthen you. He'll give you the resources to do what he's calling you to do. See, we, we often want it backwards. We want God to strengthen us and then we will devote our whole hearts to him. But that's not how he says it works. He says, I strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to me. So if you want to be spiritually strengthened, if you want to be spiritually wise, if you want to be seeing God actively working in your life, then commit your whole heart to him and you may be surprised at what he does in your life. So wise men are watchful. But wise men are also willing. See, that, that's another little problem for us, isn't it, sometimes? Sometimes we see God doing things in our lives, but they're not what we want him to be doing in our lives. So we aren't exactly willing. Now, in our story, in, in Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, they went to Jerusalem. They saw the star. Here it says, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw the star when it rose, and we have come 
to worship him. See, they did something. They moved from where they were. And sometimes that's what we will have to do. They were willing to follow wherever God leads, whatever the cost. See, many Christians never realize the joy of the Christian life because they are unwilling to pay the price. We are unwilling to pay the price and everything comes with a price. Now for, for the Magi, we read the story and we think, well, isn't that cute? You know, these three kings, these fat, jolly little kings, they got on their nice camels and they made a little day trip and presto, there they were. Didn't happen that way. We know, again, historically, that they came from somewhere around Babylon, which is modern-day Iran. And if you take out a map and you look, the distance from Iran to uh, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Israel, is roughly a thousand miles. It's the same as going from here to Los Angeles. Now you think about that. On a camel, across a desert, with bandits and thieves. This is a big undertaking. This cost them a lot of money. They couldn't go by themselves. They had to have an entourage with them to protect them or, or they wouldn't have had any gifts left to give if they got there at all. Highwaymen probably would have killed them. So this was a big deal. This took some planning on their part. They didn't see the star and go jump on their camel that night and take off. They had to assemble all this entourage, they had to get everything in place, and then they had to travel. Now, on a good day, on a camel, if everything goes right, you can go about 33 miles. You're going a thousand miles. 33 miles at a time. That's going to take you a while to get there. And how many of you have ever been on a long trip where everything went exactly right. <laughs> so it probably took them more than that length of time to get there. So this was a big deal for them. It wasn't just a, an off-the-cuff undertaking. The journey was fraught with danger. It was hot. It was unpleasant. There was thirst. There were bandits. Yet, they were willing to be uncomfortable. Now, here's a question for you. How many of you are willing to be uncomfortable in the coming year in order to accomplish what God's calling you to do? Are you willing to be a little uncomfortable? Maybe, maybe it's going to be uncomfortably financially for you. Maybe it's going to be uncomfortable time-wise for you. Maybe it's going to be uncomfortable in that it interrupts some things that you had thought you would rather be doing. Are you willing to pay the price? To be a little uncomfortable? In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, we read this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Two things I want you to get from that piece of scripture. There's a lot there, but the two things I want you to take away in regards to this message is, first, in the first verse, he tells us to lay aside every sin and encumbrance. So, oh, well, I, I don't, I'm not a bad sinner. I don't have, I don't steal and rob and rape and pillage and all those things. Uh, so, I don't, that, so I want you to completely forget about the sin part, even though you're all, you're all sinners. And some of you are pretty good at it. I know I am. But forget the sin part. Lay aside every encumbrance. Now what does that mean? Well, he, what he's saying is, lay aside anything and everything that hinders you from fulfilling God's purpose for your life. Everything. Good things as well as bad things. Well, what good things might hinder you? Well, we've already talked about them. Our priorities, things we want to do, things that we place more important than God's plan for our life. 
So lay those aside. And then the other thing I want you to take away from this is in the second verse where it says that Christ endured the cross for the joy set before him. Now you think about that. Is the author of Hebrews on drugs? How can he talk about the cross being a joyful thing? Well, he's not. It wasn't a joyful thing. It was a horrible thing. We know that. But he endured the horrible thing for the joy of the resurrection that was going to follow it. You see, without the crucifixion, there could be no resurrection. And often it's that way in our lives. We want God to do something in our lives. We want him to, to do something that's going to make us feel really great and all of that sort of thing. And he says, oftentimes he says, okay, but you've got to endure this first. Oh, no, no, it's too hard. Don't want to do it. Okay. Are you willing to be uncomfortable? Now, God doesn't ask us to go to the cross. He usually doesn't ask us to give up everything we have. He usually doesn't ask us to go off to Africa if we don't want to go to Africa. But he does ask us sometimes to do things that are a little out of our comfort zone. And the question is, are you willing to move out of your comfort zone to follow Jesus Christ? The wise men were willing, they were ready, they were focused. Wise men are also wary. They're wary, W-A-R-Y. Well, what does that mean? Well, in John chapter 4, verse 1, he says this, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. Wary simply means that uh, you aren't gullible. You don't believe everything everybody tells you, especially when it comes to spiritual things. Uh, You've probably experienced people coming to you from time to time and saying, well, you know, God told me, and then you can fill in the blank. Well, you need to be wary of those kinds of statements. Sometimes people will say, well, God told me I should tell you he wants you to fill in the blank. Well, maybe so, maybe no. You need to be wary, you need to examine the, the proposition they're laying out before you and see if it's really a godly thing or not. You see? Now, you do a little pastoral counseling and you'll find people all the time doing stuff like that. You know, well, well, God told me he wants me to be happy, so therefore I can leave my wife and go off with this other woman. Or vice versa, it doesn't matter, you can plug it in. God told me all kinds of things, but if they won't hold up to scripture, God didn't tell them at all. You see? So we need to test the spirits. We need to be cautious. We may think we know where and what God wants to do in our lives, but if we depend solely on human logic, there's a big chance we could be wrong. If we depend solely on human emotion, there's a big chance that we could be wrong. We need to be wary. We need to know what the scripture says. We need to be able to check these things. So the wise men go, and they make this journey, and they come to Jerusalem. Now isn't that interesting? Why didn't they just go to Bethlehem? You ever wonder about that? You know, the, the scenes we see, the, where the, the, the nativity scene and the stars over the, the Bethlehem there. Well, if the star was over Bethlehem, why do they go over here to Jerusalem? I'll tell you why. I think. Now, it's not spelled out for us. But I'll tell you why I think. I think the star appeared to them, and then the star went away. I don't think the star was like the cloud and the pillar of fire in the book of Exodus and, and Numbers where the people are going across the desert. I think the star was vague. Now, why would the star be vague? because they needed to demonstrate some faith. So God put the star up there, then the star fades away as they start their journey. That happens to us, doesn't it, sometimes? God puts a definite call on us to, to start heading a certain direction in some area in our lives, and, but then he doesn't spell it all out, he leaves it a little vague. Okay? So, the wise men make their journey 
but they miss their mark. Instead of ending up in Bethlehem, they end up in Jerusalem. Now, of course, God has all that in his plan. It's all there. It's already written in. And so they ask, where is the child to be born? And who did they ask? They asked King Herod, okay, who is probably the second most despicable person that ever lived in the first century, Herod. He would be second to somebody like to Nero, probably. But he was known for killing people. He was just not a nice person. Killed his own relatives. Just a terrible man. And they ask him, where is the child to be born? And in verse 3 of chapter 2, we read one of the classic understatements of all time. And we read that Herod was deeply troubled. Well... Herod was incensed. He was terrified. He was all at the same time. But he hid it from them. And he says to them, he, well, first he calls, calls the religious folks and they say, well, everybody knows where he's going to be born because it was prophesied he'll be born in Bethlehem. So Herod tells the wise men, he says, well, you guys go on over there and when you find him, you come back and let me know so I can go and worship him. Yeah. Yeah. So the wise men, though, are wise for a reason. Because they're wary, they're cautious. And what does Peter tell us in chapter 5, verse 8? That we're to be cautious, we're to be sober-minded, we're to be alert, because our adversary, the devil, prowls like a, around like a lion, waiting for an opportunity. And that's just what Herod was doing here, and what Satan was doing through Herod. But the wise men are wise. They saw through Herod's scheme. So are you searching for, through God's word? Are you listening to wise counsel? Are you surrounding yourselves with people of God who can advise you in these situations? I hope so. Because if you're trying to go it alone, you know, the Bible's metaphors are, are so great so right on you think about it you've all if you haven't been there uh, you, you've all seen television shows about safaris and wild animals and those sorts of things and and you, you take lions or most any uh, creature that preys on other creatures and and what do they look for when they look at a herd of whatever when a lion looks at a herd of antelope or buffalo or whatever the weak. They don't attack the one in the middle of the herd, do they? No. They go after the straggler, the one that's off here by himself. And that's what Satan will do to you. If, if, you're, not, if you're not in church, if you're not in God's Word, if you're not uh, surrounding yourself with, with spiritual advisors, he will attack you. You are vulnerable. So be, be wise. Be cautious. So wise men are wary. Wise men are worshipers. They're worshipers. What did, they, what did they do? Matthew chapter 2, verses 9 and following. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star they had seen when it rose went before them. Now, now the star has reappeared, you see. Why did the star reappear now? Because in faith they had moved from Babylon to Jerusalem. And now the star reappears. And you'll find that works in your lives too. You'll feel God's call in your life. You'll move out. You'll start to act on that call. It's kind of vague. You don't know for sure where you're going or how it's going to work out. But you stay true to the course. And eventually the star comes back up. And you say, oh, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Think about it. The rich and powerful bowing to the poor, helpless baby. These are powerful men. These are rich men. And yet they're bowing down and worshipping this baby. 
You think the Holy Spirit might have been involved here a little bit? You think he might have been working in this, those guys' lives? Sure he was. Matthew tells us that the wise men were filled with joy. See, and that's what happens when we follow God's plan. It may be hard. It may be costly. It may be time-consuming. It may be fraught with danger. We don't know. But when we reach the goal, when we fulfill the call, there's a joy that just can't be really articulated even. It's like what Paul says, a, a, a peace that passes all understanding. And that's the same way with this joy that these wise men felt at having arrived and seeing the baby. When we become worshipers, we see what is truly important. When we become worshipers, we see what is truly important. When our eyes are on Christ, then we see clearly. Now notice their worship included giving to the king. That's another component of being a joy-filled, mature Christian. You know, it's been said, and you hear me say it probably more than you want me to say it, but uh, you can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. You just can't do it. Think about it. The people you love, you give to. You give of your time, you give of your treasure, you give of whatever it is you have. So we say we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But I can't afford to give him anything. Well, I think it's contradictory. When we become worshipers, we become givers. Because you cannot worship without giving. Now you can give without worshiping. There's people that do that. Okay? And if you give to some organizations, I hope you don't worship them. You know, it's good to give to them. I'm not saying it's not. But if you worship God, you have to give to Him. You can't help but give to Him. Gold, frankincense, myrrh. Now we've all, if we've been around church very long, we've heard messages about those different things. But I think the simplest thing to see there is each one gave what he had. And that's the beautiful thing about God. That's all he asks. And it, you, you, you've heard me talk about the shepherds and the wise men. The shepherds gave what they had. What they have. Nothing. So they came and they gave him their worship. And it's, it's why, that's why I like the little drummer boy song so well. If you really listen to the words... What's it all about? It's about this kid that had nothing to give except his ability to play the drums. And that's, so that's what he did. You see? So if, if you're sitting there and you say, well, I'm a pauper, and it's true, that God's fine with it. Remember the story of the widow's mite? You know? Jesus, I, I, I love some of our modern theology. You know, we're not supposed to talk about money and nobody's supposed to know what you give and all that. But that's not biblical. That's all been generated by humans. And, and I think the reason is the, the humans that don't give or the ones that give miserly don't want anybody to know. You see? So, what, what, you think about that story of the widow's mite for a minute. What was Jesus doing when the people were giving her offering? He was watching the offering plate to see who put in what. Wasn't he? He was. And so when this widow put in her mite, which would be probably equal to our penny, he says to those who had put in a lot more, she has given more than anybody. Why? Because a penny's worth less than a dollar? No. Because that was all she had. So that's how God looks at our giving, not by how much in dollar value, but how much in regard to how much he's blessed us with. So I could put a penny in and God would not be very pleased with that because he's given me a lot more. 
So we give proportionately, we give generously, as the wise men did. Because it is the wise thing to do. You cannot love without giving. Now one last thing I want to see here about the wise men is you'll notice that they didn't return to Jerusalem, but they returned, the Bible says, by another way. And I think what we need to take away from that is you cannot have an encounter with Jesus Christ without being changed. You can't do it. If you tell me you have accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior and it hasn't affected your life, then you haven't accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you tell me as a Christian you have spent time in God's Word, time on your knees, time in fellowship with others, and it hasn't impacted and changed your life, then you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because you can do that. You know that? You can come to church every Sunday. You can read the Bible. You can even pray without ever knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The only way to do that is when He calls, you answer. Okay? But if you're on the couch watching television, you're going to miss the call. You, you need to be watching. So here's a question for you. Did you have any life-changing encounters with Jesus Christ in 2013? I don't know. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Here's another question. Would you like to have a life-changing encounter with Jesus Christ in 2014? We're probably all going to say yes to that. We would like to do that. But are we willing to pay the price? So what can we take away from this story? The story of the wise men is a story of worshipers. Let's make it our story. Let's truly become worshipers this coming year. Let's be alert for Christ's star in our lives. So I think he puts it there more often than we know. But we're asleep. That star may appear in his word, it may appear in a small group you're a part of. It may appear in our corporate worship service. It may appear in the quiet of your bed. I don't know. But it won't appear if you're absent. It won't appear if you're absent. We're, we're, we're so casual in our worship, you know, you know, it's, it's, we'll talk about this next week. I'll just warn you ahead of time. You know, I'll go to church today if nothing comes up. You know, I'll participate in a small group if nothing comes up. I don't have time to read God's Word today. You know? Well, what if the day we skip reading His Word was the day He was going to reveal something to us? You'll never know. You'll never know. I firmly believe God wants to do a lot more in our lives than we ever will know. So, be willing to take a chance. Be willing to endure a little uncomfort. Be wary and test the spirits. Worship God with our actions. Remember, the wise men didn't kneel down in Babylon and praise God for the birth of the baby that took place over in Bethlehem. They got up and they went. So the question is, what does God want of me in 2014? He wants me to worship Him. Everything else, you can wrap it all up and fit it in that package of worship. So let's become worshipers. And let's seek Him with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, with all our strength. And when we do, He will reveal Himself to us. He will strengthen our hearts. And He'll make it a pretty exciting trip. So join me this coming year and try it. When you get up Sunday morning, come to church 
with the idea that when you get here, you're going to sing with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You're going to listen to the message with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Doesn't matter whether the music's any good. Doesn't matter whether the message is any good. What matters is my heart's going to be in it 100%. The same when you go to your small group, the same when you approach your Bible reading, the same when you go, go to God in prayer. Say, this year, whatever I do, I'm going to do it 100% with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you might be amazed at how much better your worship experience is. Pray with me. Father, thank you. Thank you for these wise men, Lord, and thank you that you have called all of these wise men and women here today. Lord, to hear this message, Father, that uh, you are putting that star in our lives uh, more often than we think. So help us, Lord, to be vigilant, to be watchful, to be wise in everything we think, do, and say. And as we anticipate the coming year, to really plan to be worshipers. To plan to act like we are sons and daughters of the great living God. The God who spoke this whole universe into existence, who keeps it functioning as it should. And Lord, who loved us so much that before the foundation of the earth, you wrote our names. And now you've called us out of darkness into your kingdom of marvelous light. And Lord, if there's anyone here who doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, now is the perfect time to correct that. And if that's you, all you need to do is just in the quietness of your heart say, Yes, Jesus, I need you as my Lord and Savior. I want to become a worshiper of the great living God. And it'll be done. And you spend the rest of your life on this earth serving Him and know a peace and a joy that you have never known before. And then, even better, one day you'll step into eternity with Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, thank you for being so good to us, for allowing us to be worshipers of you. In Jesus' name, amen.